Hi, welcome to Ivy Brain, the talk show for entrepreneurs, where you send in your tough questions and we host experts who have the answers. I'm your host, Rena. Today's segment is about negotiating that term sheet. And our guest expert for today is Ted Wang, a partner at the leading Silicon Valley law firm, Fenwick & West. Ted, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Founders vesting. That's something that most entrepreneurs are interested in. So tell us a little bit about what's the typical founder vesting schedule. Have you seen acceleration of vesting? Right. So founders vesting is um, typically founders buy their shares of common stock at the, in, at the outset of the company, and it's subject to a buyback right whereby the company can buy back the shares at the next to cost. So, you know, if the founders have... Uh, 4 million shares, and the, and the typical vesting is a four-year vest. So if the founders get 4 million shares, it'll mean roughly a million shares will, will vest uh, per year. It's usually done monthly. And, and you know, so if the founder were to leave after two years, the company would have the right to buy back 2 million of those shares at, at you know, 20 bucks. It's usually okay. a very low number. Um, I have an odd philosophy about this, and it's some, maybe somewhat counterintuitive, mm -hmm. and, and I... I've written an article on it that's available uh, uh, for Matt Marshall, so if you want we'll to We'll put that on our website. Yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, it, uh, I, I think that the, the smartest thing an entrepreneur can do with respect to vesting is take a, a very standard vesting schedule, and that is take a, a, a four-year vest with um, a full acceleration on double trigger, and I'll, I'll explain what that is in a second. And, and so, so when I tell people, that, I tell my startup companies, when I'm forming the companies, I, you know, I'll tell them, I'll give them this advice, and they'll say, well, why would we do that? Why not you know, give ourselves some extra stock up front or give ourselves some good acceleration, or mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera? And my theory is that, you know, first of all, there's a reason to have this program in place, and it, it properly aligns the incentives, going back to that first point about right. aligning incentives. Right. I mean, it's going to take a little while to get a startup company off the ground. It's going to take longer than everyone out there thinks, and that's kind of a rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. And uh, you want, and so you want to have a vesting schedule that's going to incent people to stick around. Um, and if you start throwing in fancy bells and whistles like, well, if you get fired, you get all your stock, or if the company gets sold, you get all your stock, it can confuse uh, and create can confuse th those incentives and create some some other problems, and so instead of burning a lot of calories on um, trying to negotiate a more favorable vesting schedule, if, if you put something together that's reasonable and sort of you know like right up the middle or vanilla, plain vanilla as you want to say it, um, what I've learned is wh when a venture capitalist comes in and looks at that, they're much less likely to disrupt it and mess with it in any way. Mm -hmm. So if you've been kind of slogging away for eight months and you have a four-year vest, they're going to say, okay, he's got eight months vested, but that's, you know, okay, fine. It just seems reasonable. Whereas if you try to get yourself, you get greedy, uh, and you try to take like a three-year vest with full acceleration on this or full acceleration on that, uh, then the VCs are going to come in. If you do get your company funded, and I think you should you know, be planning for success, uh, then the VCs will come in and say, you know, look, this is not acceptable. We're going to start again. And right. now you're in, in a much worse negotiating posture because essentially Greenfield, they're going to start, start from scratch. Got it. And just briefly to circle back on the double trigger, what that means, the double trigger means the company gets sold and you get fired within some period right. thereafter. Right. Okay. Board of directors. Yeah. What do you recommend in terms of an optimal board composition? Yeah, it's probably the the most important uh, provision uh -huh. in a term sheet. Uh, board of directors, because ultimately the board has the responsibility of running the company and managing the day to day affairs and, and hires and fires the team and and um, and and really manages the CEO. So it's a, it's a very important um, a very important provision. You know, optimally you, you want to pr try to bring in the best board that you can. And so from a founder's – but also you want to kind of weight it enough for the founders. So from the founder's perspective, an optimal board is going to contain, uh, you know, two, two of the founders' types. And obviously the math depends on – Right, the right. Teams. By the way, let's answer that one first. Sure. What is an optimal board size? Five? Yeah, I, I mean, as the company grows, you want to kind of plan for it to grow. So I think uh -huh. very early, sometimes three is fine. Uh -huh. I mean, it, it's not great to have multiple – or m multiple founder board members, I haven't, it doesn't tend to work out all that well. So, so you recommend a single 
founder on the board? I mean, if you, if you can get away with a, or at an early stage, you know, we usually you can get one investor, a founder, and an outsider. Interesting. Right? Okay. And you'd like that outside. And the question is, well, who picks the outsider? Right. You'd like it to be picked by you. Of course. Uh, the founders so in the founding team. Okay. Uh, occasionally, founder dynamics don't allow for that. And uh-huh. then, then I would just kind of double the, double the other relevant right. things. So you have two, two, one right. is, another, okay. is another good way to go. Okay. So um, I think, you know, board meetings, you want to be efficient and effective. Mm-hmm. And if you have too many folks around the table, it can be an impediment. It can also be a big impediment to have reporting inequity. So if you have, you know, someone on the board who is reporting to another board member, you know, it, it can create a problem because, you know, the founders at the board level, you need to talk about who's right. causing problems. And so having sometimes a mid-level, and the person's only mid-level, mid-level is the wrong term, but maybe a, a VP level guy who mm-hmm. now has to come to the board meeting and evaluate his peers and here's his, here his or her peers being evaluated can be problematic. Okay. Locking rights. What are your opinions on that? Yeah. So blocking rights are the things that the uh, preferred stockholders get to have a say on that you can't do without, without their consent. And some of them are, are, are pretty standard, right? I mean, you're not going to want to be able to um, you know, do a deal with yourself or, <laughs> right? Or, or, uh, but the, the big issues tend to be, the, the real issues tend to be around two different things. The first is uh, raising another round, and that's fairly standard. I, it's almost, I almost never see a, a financing where the preferred doesn't get to block the next round of financing. Okay. And the second is, is selling the company. And that's where a lot more conversation takes place. Uh, but that's a sticky issue, right? It is a sticky issue. Because there's often, I think, a difference of uh, incentives. But, and that's the point, I think, going back to the, the first point I made you know, about what are you trying to do? You're trying to align right. incentives. And it's a good place to have the conversation about, mm-hmm. you know, what's an appropriate block. So the, 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 the spectrum ranges from no block at all to, um, you know, a block at X value. So if you're making less than 3X your money or 4X right. or whatever that exit multiple is to, you know, just a blanket block. Right. The reality is that the documents don't always tell the whole story. I mean, if you have a three-person founding team and it's a, you know, a normal technology company where the technology is reasonably useless without those technologists, mm-hmm. if they're ready to sell the company and there's a, right. doesn't, you know, the block, even if the, the preferred guys can technically block, Right. It's not They're not a, going to. Yeah, it, 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 they can. I, I don't. I don't want to say not going to because I've seen it done. Really? Um, well, you know, some kind. How do you build a company if the board and the founding team is not aligned? Well, I mean, sometimes folks go. I mean, it's, it, it, I've that's seen an interesting. So, so talk a little bit about that. Um, so, this is a good scenario. There's a uh, potential acquisition offer. Right. And the board feels that the exit multiple is not sufficient, right. and there's a blocking right. right. What options does the entrepreneur have? Well, there's not all that many options. I mean, you, you, it's the only, it, 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 you're, you're threatening to shoot yourself in the leg. I mean, that's the only, the only mm-hmm. possibility. You say, well, I'll walk out of here, and, and if, that, if you've put two years in the company mm-hmm. and uh, have a you know, big equity stake and have built something up, and, and you know you're going to, you know, if, if your departure harms the company, well, that's a problem. You're, you're just right. you're harming yourself. You know, you're threatening to you know, right. shoot yourself in the leg. Right. It's not that effective. And if worse, if it doesn't harm the company, right. You know, right. Then, right. then you're just going you know, to give up uh, some some future okay. equity rights. That you can get. Have you seen uh, an an option for the entrepreneur to actually exit and potentially sell his or her shares? I have. Okay. I, I've seen deals where um, and. If you have a very hot company and it gets to be a competitive deal, there, there's some interesting bells and whistles you can put on this. And, and one, one I've seen is where there's a block, um, and if the block is not, if the block is exercise, in order to exercise the block on, on an exit, mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the preferred had to buy a certain percentage of the founder's stock. Okay, so that would that be an price. interesting thing to put into a term sheet Yes. when you're not in a competitive situation. When okay. You, when, when, you when, are, when you are. Way before. Well, but can you change a term sheet in the midst of a situation like that? Or can you change an agreement? Um, you, you want to put it in the – that's the type of term that if you asked – if you had one VC and you were heads up just one-on-one with them and asked, oh, gee, if you're going to exercise your blocking right, I would like you to have to buy back my shares, they right. would laugh in your face. Oh, I but, see. Okay. But, <laughs> but if, they, if they're trying to get this deal and there are two other VCs you know, who are you know, bidding as well okay. and, you know, and, and, and they – want to add, they might say, okay, yeah, well, okay. 
We'll so something to it. consider putting in there. Okay. Uh, liquidation preferences. Yeah. So I talked a little bit about the liquidation preference and about the, the participating preferred and non-participating preferred and how it works. And, you know, it's really an, it, it's actually quite related to the blocking point, right? Mm -hmm. Because here what we're talking, and you can kind of see them on a, on a spectrum. The question is, um, you've paid a penny for the, your shares or, you know, less than a penny or whatever the right. price is. And so now someone's coming in and paying a dollar, and the question is, well, when is the right time? How much should they get when, you sell, when they sell the company? You know, if, it, you know, if, they're gonna sell, if you're going to sell the company at a low value, right? right? And, and that's the key here is that none of this stuff matters at a high value, right? right. I mean, if, all, if, if things are going great guns, if you're, if you're YouTube and you've kind of caught on a viral adoption thing and everything's going up and to the right, Great, you know who cares? And, and none of these points are, are remotely uh, relevant. But if um, it's really in those sort of middle scenarios where maybe you know you think it's time to sell, and and right. and uh, the and the entrepreneur and the VCs might think, well, there's more there's more opportunity. And remember too, I think it's a really important point. Remember too that they just have a different. Um, portfolio than you have, right? right? So this is the last two years of your life or right. three years or whatever it is. And if you're a, a first-time entrepreneur uh, and, you know, you don't happen to come from a fabulously wealthy family, you're looking at, like, some massive percentage of your, you know, mm -hmm. net worth is tied up in this one asset. Right. And so if someone says, well, you know, you can cash out for X millions of dollars, mm -hmm. boy, that, that might sound pretty mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Whereas for the VCs, they're saying, okay, well, you know, this is a 7X exit for me, but I really think next year if we stick with this, I can get to 14, right. and that's a lot better for me. Right. And, and it's not that they're bad, and, and that's why I kind of go back from them not right. being bad people. It's not that they're bad people. You just got to understand what their business is and what right. they're trying to accomplish. Right. Um, so going to that protective, the, the, the liquidation preference, that one thing I've seen done is people say, well, you know, I'm going to get the first, you know, 3x off the table or, or more commonly it's done. I'll take the first money and then we'll all share, but I'm still getting extra preferences until I get to 3x or some, okay. some number like that. And that, the idea is, I think that's a, a reasonably intelligent design because what you're saying if you're a venture capitalist is, look, okay, if we're going, let's agree today that if you're going to go for the low exit, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to do well until I've gotten three times my money right. back. And at least now you're having the conversation and, and you're going to be successful mm -hmm. in negotiating terms because you understand what it is that he or she is trying to accomplish and you try to align that with what you're trying to accomplish. Okay. Uh, let's change gears a little bit and talk about what are some of the top reasons that negotiations fall apart mm -hmm. when the two parties walk away? Mm -hmm. um, a couple things. I mean, one is you don't have unlimited bites at the apple. I think people forget that. And it, there's a little bit of over-negotiation. Uh -huh. And I think for a, a VC, they have there's opportunity cost in, in, in taking time and negotiating a term sheet. And, you know, they'll, they'll send it out. They'll take a couple of, of uh, reviews. And, you look, you should make whatever comments you're going to make. But at some point in time, they're going to say, gee, well, this is just more brain damage than it's worth, and it's taking too long. Okay. And it also sets a bad stage. I mean, in a way, uh, I think a venture capital relationship is a lot like a marriage in the sense that you're, you're stuck with these guys for, <laughs> for a while. That's and, right. uh, and, you know, if you're a difficult partner and, and, you know, you're sort of iterating on smaller points and not compromising and, you know, not trying to look for com common ground, you kind of, they kind of get sick of it. Um, so, so, so over negotiating. Over negotiating is definitely on one. On small points. Over negotiating and small points are the kind of is vexatious to them, or just being even on big points, just saying, look, you know, taking outrageous stands. People eventually just say, fine, it's you know, life is short. I'm just going to move on. Mm -hmm. um, any dishonesty. I mean, it, that's that's a, a, a definite killer. So if you if you you know, you, you want to air your dirty laundry as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, if, so if you've oversold, if you've sort of said things about the business that are not true, if those things between term sheet and getting the deal done, you know, they're going to check through your underwear drop pretty, pretty carefully. Right. So you got to – so if you've been sort of fibbing about numbers or about projections or whatever it is, that's going to come out. And um, – and that, that, can, that can blow up a deal, uh, and particularly any acts of personal dishonesty. Mm -hmm. In other words, where you've said something and maybe enriched yourself in some way. And that, that, that's something that, that's radioactive in mm -hmm. a deal. And the other thing that can happen is the landscape just changes. You know, mm -hmm. Sometimes that happens. You see uh, term sheets get signed, and then all, the, all of a sudden you know, the economy really tanks quickly or um, 
or a new competitor emerges or you know, something like that. Okay. But nothing else that's sticky on a term sheet mm -hmm. that a VC or an entrepreneur you've seen over and over fight about that one item. Uh, would a valuation be one of those things? Oh, well, Can I mean, you walk key, away because of that? Yeah, I mean, if you're, kind of, you're going to force rank all of the, the, uh, the items, I mean, valuation is number one, right? Okay. So, uh, ultimately, if you can't agree on value, then you, you know you just there's nothing more to talk about. Um, and then there's and and then there are all the the, the second. I think that we've gone over all the second order issues, which okay. are uh, board of directors, liquidation preferences, and blocking rights. Those okay. are kind of the second things. And then there are tertiary issues as well, but those are much less likely to blow okay. up the deal. Although I've seen them. Uh, I mean, one of the oddest ones. Just I'll throw it out there, but no, probably no one else will ever hear of this again. But I've seen um, an indemnification agreement. I know a, a fund that, that I've, um, I've worked with in the past has a form agreement, and, it, and they're just like, this is it. We will not negotiate on it. And, and I saw it almost blow up a deal. So wow. <laughs> it's very strange. But um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They've got good lawyers, I guess, on their side um, that insist on that indemnification I agreement. I guess they're, you know, it's one of those things. Once a dog bites you, you never pet that dog again. That's so. true. That's true. Talk about, just for a moment, valuation. Uh, what is the right way to maximize the valuation from an entrepreneur's perspective? It, 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 absolutely, it's getting a horse race started. I mean, okay. it, ultimately, I mean, you know, the, the number one thing, I mean, you, you can argue with folks until you're blue in the face, but the, the only thing that's going to drive your valuation is that the, there, are, there are other bidders or the fear of other bidders coming. Okay. Okay. It's, it's okay. a simple supply. It really is. Either works. <laughs> it's really simply supply and demand okay. uh, and, at, at work. I think all, the other, I mean, a little bit more nuanced point, but also true is it's it, it's in terms of market opportunity i mean i think that is the big that's the biggest driver of valuation okay. uh, what i think entrepreneurs sometimes make a mistake is they try to position the company as not that risky and they talk about how well you know even if bad things happen we still have the, a reasonable outcome uh -huh. that's not interesting to the venture venture guys they they really don't care for them getting their money back or double their money right. in 5 years is the same is really essentially the same as losing it. I mean, right. that's not exactly correct, but it's close enough. I mean, right. they're, they're far more interested in in the fact that this has the possibility to do 10, 12, 20. I mean, and, and you got to show them that. And, and for to, to show them that, you have to show a big addressable market. Um, that is that the market for the services that you're actually selling is is big. Right. Um, you know, and that doesn't mean that the the market in which you are doing business is big. I had a company come to me and they had a technology for uh, mortgage loans and they were talking how big the mortgage industry is. And I was like, that's not a relevant point. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many trillions of mortgage loans get serviced. It's like, it's like saying, you know, that the cash register market is right, you know, right, right. a multi-trillion dollar right, market. It's, right. it's not. Absolutely. Um, well, this has been very insightful. Thank you so much for sharing. My now, pleasure. Right before we wrap up. Uh, one more question. So, what's what's the secret? Share with us one secret oh, that okay. entrepreneurs can walk away with. Sure. Um, one secret is uh, is the stock option pool and how much how many shares are available in the option pool. So, what venture capitalists will come in and say is, look, you need to have you know so what so when you um, you need to have set aside a certain number of shares for op for options for employees you have not yet hired. And okay. that, that is absolutely true, I mean, and, and that's not a – that part is 100% honest. And, and, what's sta and the standard thing to do, just so I get the honesty part out first, is to kind of do a hiring plan that maps to how long this money is intended to last. Okay. And you should have options to fill all of those seats, you know, depending on what it is. But what people don't realize is it's really just price because the option pool goes into the denominator – when you decide by which your valuation is divided, of which your valuation is the numerator, the result of which is your price per share. So it really, uh, option pool sizing is just another negotiation around price. And in fact, um, it doesn't really matter how many shares you reserve in the pool because you can always increase it later. So um, really, you just, it's just another way of arguing uh, about price. Ted, thank you so much for being on the show today. We were speaking with Ted Wang of Fenwick & West. Thank you for watching and keep winning.